Okay, so I'm delighted to introduce uh, Jim Keller, President and CTO of Tens Torrent. So if you've used an iPhone, driven a Tesla, or used an AMD computer, you have probably been the beneficiary of Jim's work. Uh, I don't think Jim knew this until I told him a few minutes ago, but we both started our careers at Harris um, and then quickly found homes at DEC. And as I said, anyone under 40 will probably not know what DEC means, but for the rest of you, Digital Equipment Corporation. Um, and we both worked there for about 10, 12 years or so. We never actually worked on the same project, believe it or not. Um, but I did have the opportunity to G see Jim's work up close. I've always admired his razor sharp intellect and ability to build world class teams. He went on to pivotal roles at AMD, where he added 64 bit extensions to the x86 architecture. He worked at Cybite and PA Semi, where he partnered with my old boss, Dan Dauberpool. Apple, where uh, he worked on the uh, iPhone application processor, AMD, again, for the new Zen architecture, Tesla, where he survived working for uh, Elon, Intel, <laughs> by the way, is there a management book coming out of that? Because I'd be really interested. Um, and I, have, I, I have a slide on Elon. <laughs> okay. And finally, now with uh, Tense Torrent. Um, as one of the most influential chip architects of our time, uh, I, for one, can't wait to hear Jim's talk. So with that, Jim Keller. All righty. <clears throat> so I, I, I do my own presentation, so this is a screen grab. It's a little ro lower resolution, I hope. Um, you skipped one. I, I worked at Intel for a couple of years. Oh, I got that in there. Was that in there? Yeah, it was very short. Yeah, that was, that was short. <clears throat> it's very impactful on me. I think I aged 10 years in two years. <laughs> It was really fun. There's lots of good people there. But it's like working in a computer museum, so. Um, which, oh, did I say that out loud? I heard Stanford still has libraries, by the way. Like I was talking to some professors over here. Yeah, things are changing. And I, I wanted to talk about um, a couple topics. And I asked Liam what to talk about. He said, oh, you know, computer design and stuff. I said, great, I can pontificate. So this, this chat, this talk's a little bit experimental. Um, I hope people like it. Um, if you don't, ask lots of questions. It'll make it more fun. So, oh, this buzzes. This is really fun. So I want to talk a little bit about, I was going to talk about Moore's Law, single-threaded computing, multi-threaded computing, and AI. These are four things I've worked on for 42 years. So it's starting to add up. And and I always thought it's good to do a little bit of history. So I went into Wikipedia a while back. And the, the history of math and computer science is kind of wild. Like they were using uh, <coughs> numbers 10,000 years ago, at least, geometry, calculations. Um, I, I, I was taught that the Greeks invented Pythagorean theorem, but I was in Egypt, and the pyramids were triangular like 73,000 years before that. Uh, a friend pointed out that you know they might have invented the, the zero a year earlier if they actually had the zero to put it there. <laughs> but if you look at computer science, it's kind of wild. They went, you know, they noodled around with addition, and some of the math got turned into mechanical computers. But it was really information theory that was pivotal, right? And then kind of computation theory. So Shannon and uh, these guys like Ch and Turing changed how we thought about it. That's a revolution in thinking about things. And then I was shocked when I read Canoose. Did anybody read Canoose, the book on data structures, one or two? Like he wrote multiple books about how all data structures and programming models worked in the, what, the 60s, right? It was fantastic before he actually had a computer that can run much of anything. And the last big innovation here in terms of computing was multiprocessing. It's like 1970. Everything else is refinement, right? We, you know, we built transistors. We started making them smaller, like kind of wh whistled along. And here was a, a thing that I saw years ago. So I, I knew Gordon Bell a little bit. Um, I actually met him in my first week in digital. We were using this new CAD system, which was structured design from a company called Valid out in some place called Silicon Valley. And they, we were trying to design a computer with schematic entry. You draw end gates and stuff. But 
structured as blocks, like this is a function unit, this is this. And he came, he came in the room and we were drawing, he started asking us questions and he told me how computer design should work and I told him he was crazy and like we had a big long debate and somebody walked out and said, you know, that's Gordon Bell. It's like, who? Um, Gordon Bell is the guy who made digital equipment really successful. You can track the, for people who knew digital, when Gordon was there, it went up and when he left, it went down. It was very fast. But this, this chart is inspirational because as we got more transistors, we got more transistors faster, um, then we could actually make computers faster. And we actually made computers smaller. And I only recently, somebody pointed out that the y-axis is the log of the people per computer. What a crazy metric, right? It's not just that they got smaller power, you know, footprint and everything and cost. But it changed how we use them. I think this is great. And that was an example of expectations, right? My prototype, my uh, initial title for this talk was 40 Years of Failure in Computer Design because things always go wrong. Like we build things with expectations. And here's my first example. So I was at Apple and two companies, AMD and Intel, made processors. And they came in, I won't tell you which one was which, but one of them said, <laughs> we think computer performance is plateauing for a bunch of reasons, predictability of branches, memory latency, pipeline depth, a whole bunch of reasons. And the other company said, we think they're gonna get 10% faster every year. And they both executed on their plans. <laughs> and <coughs> and it, it went this way so fast, it's, it's not funny. It was amazing. So, so expectations really inform what we do. Happens all the time. Here's a good example. This is super puzzling. A professor here was just telling me that they're going to build hardware and then make a hardware change and automatically program that to the software stack. And I just want to point out that in 1982, I met with the Fortran group at Digital Equipment, and they had 10 people working on a project to parallelize code, like Fortran programs, right? And Digital had built a computer called the 782, which is two 780s hooked together through a memory bus. And the VAX 8800 was two processors on a common memory bus. And we, we built first an asymmetrical multiprocessing operating system, a symmetrical one. They had a T and 10 people. Four years later, it wasn't done. It's still not done. It's weirdly hard. Like, this is one of those problems when you look at it, you think, what the hell's going on here? <clears throat> I showed this slide at TSMC partly because um, Jensen's one of the most innovative, insightful people about computer business I've ever met. And he always says stuff like this. Like, and I don't really get it. You know, the quote at the bottom was something like, oh, somewhere in the same article he said maybe smaller atoms would help. Right? <laughs> so I've been working in computer design since 1982. I became aware of Moore's Law, I think 19, 1990. Digital in the mid-range system group, we didn't know about Moore's Law. So we're making the VAX 8800 faster than the 780 because we thought we should make the new one faster, right? And I have a really great graph coming up about this. Um, Sam, that's a picture of Samsung, which I showed at TSMC because I think that's funny. Um, but people believe Moore's Law is dead, and it's because they're really attached to how we do things, not because they're looking at the fundamental physics. It's, it's amazing what's happened. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, modern scientists working on things that are completely wrong about everything is not uncommon. Imagine being a physicist in, what, 1300? Like, there's armies of people cal calculating epicycles, right? Almost all of physics has been wrong for almost all of time, right? <laughs> and, and lots of people go to universities like this one, and they learn a lot about it, and they teach their students, and the students repeat what the professor said. And, you know, who knows if it's true or not, right? Some, some things have lasted. One of my favorites, like E equal MC squared seems pretty solid, right? E is not exactly defined. M is not defined. And the speed of light is a ratio of two numbers with arbitrary units. Like, like we take these things for granted, and it's really kind of amazing. And we also live in this funny world of exponential growth built on diminishing return curves. Like this is one of the things that really, when I was at Intel, we were working on like, so Intel was the Moore's Law company and everybody in the world, including people who worked at Intel said Moore's Law is dead. 
if I did a little bit of math, if Moore's Law is dead and we're the Moore's Law company, then you know, I think we might be dead too. And, and so I set out to, to prove Moore's Law is not dead. And then I gave a talk at Berkeley right in front of David Patterson, who's a great guy, super smart, and he's saying Moore's Law is dead. And he sat right in the front row and he's taking notes and looking at me like, <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing. Almost every technology has a diminishing return curve. No matter what you do, you start working on it, you have initial fast progress and it slows down. And progress doesn't happen because you, you figure out how to fix it. Progress is, happens because you get it on a different curve. There are no rotary phone engineers, right? Rotary phones are replaced by push buttons, are replaced by smartphones, replaced by iPhones. And now the world's going, what? How do you make an iPhone better? I don't know. I think it's one of those diminishing, I think it's done. Right? I, ten years from now, nobody's going to talk about iPhones. My prediction, right? And Steve Jobs is the one who originally pointed this out to everybody at Apple. He said, the thing you have to know is you're on a diminishing return curve. You have to get on the next curve. Right? And the terrifying thing from the marketing point of view is when you got on the next curve, you'll probably be worse. You know, so all the overlapping spots of these curves, you have to jump from a plateau that's good to one that's worse. And this is a problem in all science and engineering. And it's terrifying, but if you don't do it, somebody else will and they'll kill you. So, so I want to reframe this talk a little bit because we're hitting the limits of things. And this is the experimental thing. And I've been talking to some friends. I have a friend named Kylon Gibbs who's started an AI company. And we're remarking about how different AI is from information, right? Computers don't understand anything about what they do. Big data, it's ones and zeros, right? The intelligent actor in a big data system is not the computer, it's the human being. Right? So we live in a funny world. There's quantum reality down at the bottom, quantum fields, uncertainty principle, atoms. They're, they're really interesting. And then we live in a physical reality which is mostly mediated by Electromagnetic forces, chemistry, gravity. For computer design, we mostly ignore gravity, right? But electromagnetic fields are big. Kind of the macro things, right? And those things have positions in the world to do stuff. That's information reality, let's say. You know where everything is. You know how big they are, right? And then there's knowledge about that stuff. And to date, only humans had knowledge about anything, right? It's a really, it's a really funny thing. Or another way to do this is transistors literally connect quantum reality to physical reality, right? Down at the bottom, atoms, you know, have shells. They have extra electrons. They donate them. They cause electric fields. If you put, you know, atom, electrons in a really small place, they tunnel out for you. There's all these quantum effects all over the place, right? But when you use a transistor, you have a cube of silicon patterned and it moves an electric field from a one volt to a zero, which is hilarious. We use 100 million atoms to transduce an electrical voltage of one or zero, right? That's, that's a macro effect, right? And then computers give us information reality, and what we're starting to see is AI programs are actually starting to have knowledge of things. This is really different. So I want to walk through Moore's Law computation and a little bit about AI. All right, so we know what Moore's Law is. This chart is just unbelievable. So 2x every two years, right up to the Apple M1 Ultra, it's been on the dot. So people are pretty aware of this guy, right? And it's literally the foundational element of all computer design. Right, because as we got more transistors, we had to figure out how to use them. I'm an architect. I'm like, more transistors is like the gift that kept on giving. Because when you have 10,000 transistors, you can make one kind of computer. When you have 10 million transistors, you make a, literally a very different kind of computer. And here's a picture of a FinFET. I put the, there's something called sketchfab.com, which has 3D models. This is super fun if anybody wants, looks at a transistor. Um, so the, the, perp, the maroony things are fins sticking up. The blue is, I think, silicon oxide. Um, the green is another insulator. The little red and purple things are the source and drain epitaxial growth. 
and the red thing over the, the middle of the fin in a couple of places is the gate, right? The transistor is actually mostly insulator, it turns out, and then the stuff on top is the metal stack absent the insulator, right? So if you look at a little silicon comes in a lattice, there's about eight atoms in a lattice cell, the constant's 0.54. Transistor is about 100 nanometers cubed, so a five nanometer transistor, five nanometer doesn't actually mean anything. That's a marketing number. Everybody knows that. But the fin is on the order of five nanometers wide. That's actually not patterned with litho. That's etched, right? And then the fin has a length. And I only recently got the thing. So transistors have good dry strength, have a length to width ratio of about four or five to one, right? And the fin fet wraps the length over the fin. Because when they started to make the transistor smaller, they couldn't, right? So they got stuck on the, the lithography lets you pattern things that are like 20 nanometers long. So the, the fin is etched entirely with etch. So you get your length to waist ratio by the fin wrapping around the, 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 the gate, or about around the channel. So here's an interesting number. So there's about 300,000 atoms in a five nanometer channel. And a friend of mine calculated the gate all around stuff in three nanometer. There's four of those things, and there's about 20,000 atoms per per uh, per ribbon fat per ribbon in, in the gate. So about one percent of the atoms in the transistor actually make it work. Ninety-nine percent of it is, you know, source strain epitaxy to, to manage the work function, insulator to support all this stuff. It's kind of a really small number. The fundamentals of transistors, like. At some point, when you get few enough atoms, the quant effects override how the channel engineering works. But there's something like a factor of 100 to 1,000 smaller we can make transistors, right? And, you know, the big things that drove Moore's law, like the easy stuff was litho. When they started at 6 micron, making that smaller every year was super easy, right? And then at some point, the wavelength of litho interfered with it, so then they started making lasers, right? And they got to 193, and then get past 193 was hard, so then they, they did immersion litho, which is basically shooting a laser through water, right? And then they did multi-patterning and stuff, and that ran out of energy, and then they went and built EUV. Now, EUV is the craziest thing on the planet. So they spent $100 million for a laser beam to shoot. They literally shoot lasers at metal dots to, to get EUV things to make them fuse. And I recently talked to some guys. They're using an electron particle accelerator 100 meters long, shooting electrons around a really strong magnet to get cyclotron radiation that they then lased and distributed with these mirrors who have a point like 1% reflectivity rate. So it's like a megawatt in and a milliwatt out to pattern a one nanometer thing like the ratio of size of laser to energy resulted to what you're actually trying to do is basically the craziest thing you've ever seen. But, but they're probably going to go build it. And which brings to when is the problem fundamental, right? So <clears throat> this is a pretty simple curve, E equal um, H lambda, right? So as the wavelengths get shorter, the energy goes up. Now, if you're trying to make transistors, you'd actually like this curve to be exactly the opposite of this. You'd like it to be like a 45 degree line coming up from the origin. So as you made it smaller, the energy went down, not up, right? So this turns out to be a fundamental problem. Like, so when you start to get into the fine points, the energy per photon is getting so high, it's disturbing the stuff they're trying to pattern. So that sounds like a real problem, right? Has anybody heard of, heard of DNA origami? A couple people, please look this up. It's been around for 10 years. We've talked to a few people about it. Um, most of the people doing it are biologists. They never think about computer patterning. So here's a really wild thing. The most computationally efficient, fastest, lowest power computer in the world is your brain. It's about this big. Everybody has one. Every single cell in your brain has a brain factory in it, which is capable of reproducing the entire brain. So the factory to make a brain is smaller than a brain, right? And it does everything at really low energy, at room temperature, with no fires, and it does two amazing things. It does atomic assembly, 
and it does information assembly at the atomic level. Right? So this is amazing. So my belief is Moore's Law is not dead, and every single person here has an example of why. Right? But the bridge from the rotary phone of lith lithography to this is really big, which I hope some researchers are working on this. So it turns out that the pictures here, so with the DNA sequence, with the right combination of DNA, you can make a 90 degree or 45 degree angle very repeatably. You can buy all the DNA strands. You can draw pictures with DNA in both 2 and 3D. And there's actually CAD tools online where you can specify the picture and they'll give you back the sequences. And then you can send that to a company and they'll give them to you. It's unbelievable. Super cool. All right. So Moore's Law is not dead. Um, it's certainly getting expensive, though. We'll see what happens. So I want to talk about computers a little bit, because this is kind of wild. So we've been making computers. We made programs faster by making faster computers. Right? The programs we write, literally, for the most part, if you write, a, if anybody here still program in C or assembly or everybody's in Java, there's one C programmer. Right? Like, you write declarative code. You say, you know, A equal B plus C, da, 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 you run it. And then the computer literally run, makes that faster. Right? And the software hardware contract is really solid. Right? Above, the software expects the hardware to load data from memory, do operations and registers, and store data back to memory in order, period, the end. That's, that's the law. Underneath that, the hardware goes crazy. Right? Right? So whenever you're building a hardware software thing, you need to ask the question, what's the hardware software contract? Really, really important. So digital equipment violated this hardware software contract with Alpha. We had weak memory ordering, right? Which meant that the data did not go back to memory in order all the time. And digital went bankrupt because they violated the contract, right? It all, I only re realized this recently because the AI stuff is, has a crazy hardware software contract. Because we thought, well, we're smart guys. We built this really fast computer. You just need to put a memory barrier in the right spot. We had a really good compiler group and a Unix group, and they made it work. So we had it up and running, small numbers of computers. We went to Microsoft. They ported NT to it. NT crashed every day. NT told us that the computer did not work. We said, yeah, it works. Our operating system works. And they said, well, our operating system works on these two computers, but not yours. And we're voting. You know. You can fix your computer because we're not changing our software. And we said, you're wrong. We're right. And we went bankrupt and they got bigger. <laughs> this is kind of important. Now, we build computers with abstraction layers. This is why we can do it. Liam and I worked on computers that we thought were massively incredible, 200 megahertz, six-stage pipelines. Jesus. Right? And, and somebody asked us one time, what, what do you have in your library? And we said, we have both devices in our library, N devices and P devices. <laughs> right? For a computer design, this is crazy. Now, now we have abstraction layers. The CPU has functional units, RTL. We do synthesis, place and route. There's cell libraries. There's transistors. And down at the bottom, there's unbelievably good process definition files. And then there's a CAD tool chain on every single one of those to hook those together. Right. We designed really complicated computers. So I'm a 10 store now. So the first two are Rocket and Boom. Berkeley did those. Those guys are great. A couple of kids build a computer. It's faster than any Alpha ever built by a lot. A couple of students. Uh, Boom Core is out of order three issue. Escalon is a computer. We're building a team of 70 people. It's eight wide, out of order issue, massive vector unit. Very large L1 cache. We built it in an A processor cluster. It's about 70-person team now. It's probably going to go to 100. And we can do this because of the abstraction stack. Right? Like, it's amazing what we can do because of that, because we understand what we're doing. And the thing that made transistors, computers fast. Like, the list is endless, but my favorite are transistor count gave us enough transistors to start pipelining. As soon as we could pipeline, we could raise the frequency. We spent a lot of transistors on frequency, by the way. And then as soon as we had a frequency limit, because you really can't have pipe stages faster than like 20 or 25 gates per clock, because it gets too complicated for humans to deal with. Then we went to parallelism. Then we went to out of order. I worked on EV6 and digital. And many, many people promised us we would never make that work. It was almost true. We didn't have the 
the verification infrastructure to do it. Then we added vector units, multiprocessors, data prefetch. The last two, data prefetch and branch prediction, are really wild because these use information about how the program executes to make the program faster. Right? The first are circuit techniques, architecture techniques. So Zen processor, I, I saw recently that has a percepton in it. So when I joined AMD, uh, the branch predictor wasn't very good, and they were all like, how are we going to get better? Intel's branch predictor is way better. So I went into Wikipedia. That's, that's literally Wikipedia page on branch predictors. And in the Wikipedia page, it mentioned that Intel ran a contest for the best branch predictor, and the Percepton predictor won, and it was a kid in Finland or something. So we called him up, paid him some money, and put that in Zen. Right? But the reason it worked is it had a way better idea of how to look at what the information flow of the branch pattern was. Right? It's actually a little AI thing underneath the sheets. And it made the, the, the chip about 10% faster. And since then, it's got way better. Like we used to, like EV6 had a 20 instruction out of order scheduler and about 100 instructions in flight. I've worked on a machine with 5,000 instructions in the out of order window. Like the possibilities are endless, but it takes a belief in both the technology and then go solve some of these hard problems. So computers, people keep saying, well, single threaded computers aren't going to get that much faster. That's been true for Christ, 25 years that I've been working on it, and I don't think we're close to the limit. <coughs> the next topic I'm going to talk about is parallel programs. So this is the, one of the most puzzling things. So anybody ever written a matrix multiply? I, I know in AI, we use matrix multiplies all the time, but a lot of people think matrix multiply is a routine called MM or something, right? But <coughs> the picture on the, uh, on the left is really simple. You take a row times a column and you put it in a spot, right? How, easy, how hard could that be? Now, the weirdo thing is the, the computer code that actually implements it doesn't look anything like the picture. All right, so you're, now you're running into trouble because if you have a hardware abstraction layer, that makes no sense at that level. You need knowledge to solve the problem, right? And it turns out nobody runs that code. They block the code and swizzle the code and pivot one of the matrix. There was a really great talk a couple of years ago. It, somebody said, I'm going to write a naive you know, matrix multiply algorithm on an NVIDIA GPU. And it went about 3% a peak. And then they did the HPC tweaks. They pivoted one of the matrix. They blocked the matrix. They swizzled the data. That they got the 20%. And then they used the local memory. And they, get, they got the 25%. And they got the 25% to 80% of NVIDIA's published result. It had to know how all the engines in the machine worked. Right? It's weirdly hard. So, th so this is a Wikipedia page on temperature. So every once in a while, you think you know how things work. Does anybody here know how temperature works? You know, it's a thing on the thermometer. I was talking to a friend about, like, the temperature of atoms and some kind of thing. And I thought, I'll just look up temperature, because I was thinking it was, like, the kinetic energy of a molecule or something. It just goes on and on and on. And, you know, don't get me started about heat capacity. Like, you get down into quantum dynamics really fast, quantum mechanics really fast. It's unbelievably complicated, right? And the interesting thing about computer design in a bunch of places, you walk over the cliff into unbelievably complicated really fast, and you didn't even know you were doing it. So we made parallel programming sort of work. There's a picture of the gray one. He built vectors. It was a, a brilliant vector architecture. I have, a, I have a copy of the gray one manual. I read it every couple of years. My wife is sitting, sitting in a chair, and tears coming down <laughs> my face, <laughs> paging through this manual. What are you doing? Are you reading that manual again? <laughs> you built it in like 1970. It's like a 10 nanoseconds. It's unbelievable. We built module processors. We built MPI, which is a loose C framework to let processors coordinate. Uh, Google invented MapReduce, which apparently is a good thing. And then the CUDA guys did something that was remarkable. It's like one of the few parallel programming models that's ever worked that I've seen. And, uh, but they're just crazy. So I was reading the spec on shader compilers years ago. 
because in a CPU, when we make a vector unit, we say, oh, we have this register of 64 bits. We could put two 32-bit things in there, or four 16, or we can make the register wider. We'll put 256 times eight 32-bit floating point numbers, right? Now, the array data you have might be 1,552, and the stride might be three, right? Like the, the data in the program, and the programmer doesn't give any, doesn't care at all about the fact that your vector unit has a fixed width. And then your, your programmers will spend half their life trying to map what the programmer wants to do to what this wants to do. And the GPU guys sidestep the whole problem. They write code that's a vector of a scalar program because they started with a completely different mindset. There's a screen with 2,000 by 1,000 pixels on it, and they're running a program on one pixel, right? And every once in a while, they can group a bunch of pixels, which they happily do, but the, the pixels don't interact with each other. That's how graphics works. So they wrote a vector of pixel programs, right? And that's what CUDA is. It's little little salt on top of C to do that, which is a brilliant model, right? Because it always works, can always run slow. But if you're an expert, you can do it, and they have a couple thousand people making matrix multiply go fast. So, but then, <coughs> because more is better, the new chip has 18,000 SIMD lanes in it. You have 295,000 threads running on a single chip. They can, they're planning on putting 256 chips into an NV switch, which makes the whole array of GPUs look like one big GPU, which means you could have a single program with 75 million threads in flight to keep that busy. This is the EUV version of multi-threaded programming. It's almost completely crazy. So Moore's Law is going to keep going. Single thread is going to keep going. Parallel programming has been weirdly hard. Like, and I've been working on it on and off forever. And there are certain things that actually do pretty good, final element analysis, MapReduce is brilliant. Like the, the genius of it mostly is if you have like a million users or you can break a database into a million pieces, like if you can get a macro split on something, you can go pretty fast. All right, so I made this graph a while back. Transistor count enabled things, right? So when you had very few transistors, you made very simple pro computers. With more, we could pipeline them. We could go out of order. Then we invented, they invented shaders, multi-core processors. And at some point, we had enough transistors to build AI. And I used to think AI is going to take forever. It's going to be impossible. Like the estimates of brains are like 10 to the 18th, 10 to the 20 computations a second, you know, if anybody has any numbers. There's a few people who think maybe it's a quantum effect, but I, I have no idea. But if you just map out the brains and synapses, 20 to the 18th, 20 to 8, 10 to the 18th, 10 to the 20th seems like a reasonable number. And you can buy one of those today, right? The new GPUs are a petaflop, 10 to the 15th. You put 1,000 of them in a rack, you have a brain's worth of computes. So at some, some level, it's not that surprising that AI started to, to perk up in the last couple of years. Jeff Dean at, at uh, Google said when they first started working on some AI models, they did a whole bunch of work to get the model to run going from one CPU to 64 CPUs. Because they thought more computes would help. And he said, we were just wrong by 10,000. Like getting from one to 64 didn't help at all. Right. All right. So the world, world starts to go boom. All right. So AI has already replaced vision code. When I joined Tesla, there's a big group of people doing classic vision. And classic vision was you, you analyze an image. You, you know, if you want to recognize a cat, you find the points and the round things and the fuzzy things. And if there's a certain relationship of those features with a st certain statistical distribution, you might call it a cat, right? And they were trying to figure out where lane lines were and cars were with classical vision. Didn't work at all, basically. You could re recognize cars half the time. And then AlexNet came along, and now ResNet is so good. So the AI models are better at recognizing objects and images than humans are. And one of the reasons is a human is good at this, and another human is good at that, and the AI model can take the results of all that and add it together and do it. Where language models are unbelievably good, uh, GitHub Pilot's going to replace programming. We're starting to use Pilot to do test bench generation for our processors. 
in our test bench. And they said, right now, it's very good at doing all the easy, obvious stuff. But, and then people say, well, AI will never do the hard stuff. And there's a, there's a website called Two Minute Papers. And he said, just wait two minutes. There'll be another paper. Like, it's, it's moving really fast. And I was talking with a friend about could we take an AI model and buy the world's best CAD tools, replace it in routing, run a bunch of experiments and train the model and replace the CAD tools? And the answer is probably yes. Like, there's a whole bunch of things where you think there's human knowledge programming stuff. Once that stuff is programmed, it's a database. AI models are really good at figuring this out. So we're using it for layout, test generation, code generation. And next year, we're going to try to build a, a simple RISC-V processor that's faster than the alpha processor Liam and I did, entirely from an AI model, then running entirely through open road and open source CADs next week. Like this is happening pretty fast. So I used to work with Norm Jopi, who I think was a part-time professor at Stanford. He was in the Western Research Lab, and then he was at Google, and he was one of the architects of the TPU. And we were working on a uh, bipolar computer, because at the time, this is in 1989-ish, bipolar transistors were much faster. It's bipolar, actually, it's not because they're crazy transistors. It's because, I don't actually know why they're called bipolar. So they were much faster than CMOS, right? And then so he plotted the curve of the improvement in bipolar transistors versus the improvement in CMOS transistors. And he canceled the, we canceled the project like the next day, right? So, so I worked for Elon Musk for a couple of years. And so conventional people, most people, the conventional understanding of life is things are getting a little better, they're staying the same, or they're getting a little worse, right? And then most people act like that's true. Right. And it's not a bad thing for most things. Elon thinks that there's rapid progress or failure. Right. And he will reset a, pro a problem as many times as he needs to until you have rapid progress. And I've been involved in this a little bit. And you think, really, we're blowing this up? We're only one month from finishing it? Well, the progress isn't rapid. And then what happens is, once you get on rapid progress, this happens. Norm's, norm's graph. Rapid progress always pr passes incremental progress, and it doesn't matter when you start. Right? It just depends on what the slope of these lines are. And in a world of change, even modest progress is probably falling behind. Right? Does that make sense? So AI, AI programmers describe what they do as graphs. And we have tools that so we take all the AI programs, they write them in PyTorch, which is basically crazy because it doesn't look anything like a graph, but we produce graphs and then we analyze the graphs and we map the graphs onto things, right? So that's, that's pretty reasonable to do. And almost all AI papers, when they describe a new model, they describe it in terms of a graph. But again, to the hardware software contract, what they actually do is they write PyTorch, which doesn't look anything like a graph. So don't, don't believe programmers' description of what they do. It's never true. And then AI models get trained with something, somebody called it guess the blank. When somebody first explained this to me, I just died. So you take a sentence, you delete a word. So now you have the original sentence, the sentence you're gonna do inference on, so you run it through with the blank and ask it to predict the blank. And then the correct answer is the word you deleted, right? And then you calculate the error function between the correct answer is the word you want and what it produced, and when you first train it, it's garbage, right? And then the genius of AI is many layers of matrix multiply and, and some interesting sigmoid functions, but, and by the way, I don't know how that shit works. I just know how it's computed. It's computed as A equal B times C plus D. It's all the same computation, right? And you do that a trillion times, and you can build a language model. The same thing works for images. You can take an image and delete part of the image and guess the blank. And you can do that for control systems. You can take a path of something, say how it should go, make the blank, and then these guys wrote this paper called Gatto where they trained all three kinds of things into the same model. 
right? Because you'd imagine that images and language and sequences are different things, but they're not. Right. What AI does is it takes the data, which is ones and zeros that only humans understand and computers don't know what the hell is going on, right? Sequences, images, and language are all ones and zeros, right? It embeds them in a space, which is a mathematical construct I don't understand. And then it does matrix multiplies on that data, right? And then it trains the weights. So there's a data going in called the activation and then the weights that's local to the data Right? And you slowly modify the weights so that you can make it do what you want. And what it actually is doing is calculating the relationship between everything. It's a phenomenal thing. Computers never understood any data. Right? There's no computer in the world that understands anything. The bits go in, they get modified by programs that humans write, and data comes out. AI appears to translate data into its own computational space. The computational space and the data is the same thing. Right? Think about how you think. You can fluidly look at something, identify and modify them in your head, move them around, describe them. You can take, in, you can take anything. It's all in the same space. What we call understanding isn't the sum of knowledge. It's the sum of the relationships of all that information. This is why I think knowledge is a layer above information, which is transformative. So I worked on self-driving for a while. And in parallel, I taught two of my daughters to drive a car. So in the self-driving world, we're building this big neural network, right? And then we feed it hundreds of millions of images, right? And then a lot of the times you have something like an image Right, and maybe uh, sensor data from a path, right? So you show them an image and say, what should the path be, right? And then it turns out you can use the same guess to blank data. So you say, here's an image in the path, predict the next step for the control system. Because autonomous driving, by the way, the only thing it actually does is touch the steering wheel, the brakes, and the accelerator. So the, the, thing, the feature vector you're trying to get out of the model is really simple. You just want to predict it properly. So images plus some data, and then you, you do this. That version of AI is starting to build, inside there's an image model, there's a kind of a sequence control system model that's starting to understand what that is, but that's all it understands. Right? So when I taught my girls to drive, I, I, I had two of them, so I, I put one of them down with 100 million images. <laughs> now she did that herself, she uses TikTok and stuff. And I don't think it was about driving. No, it took about 20 minutes. I gave them 20 rules. They had a general purpose intelligence, right? So if I actually drew the, the, the driving part of her brain that drove a car, it'd be a dot really small, right? Because she has a general purpose AI, which understands the world and objects and movement and with a few rules like don't hit stuff, stop at the red things, you know, stay on the, stay on the right in this country. It's pretty straightforward, right? And that's because she has a general understanding of how the world is. And it turns out the world is really well structured, right? When you look around this room, there's no arbitrary pixels in this room, right? Like people were amazed that they could take piles of 2D images and I, I heard somebody say, you'll never make a 3D image out of a 2D image and then they did it. Why? Because when you take a 2D image in this room, the only way the pixels can be what they are is because they're in a 3D world, which the AI model can figure out. Right, they're structuring, it's the same in language, right? All the human utterances, well, 90% of them anyway, are sensible, right? There is structure in the sequence of every word. And those word, and if you take enough of those, they're all structured together. And at some deep level, you can take an image model and train it and it develops a language for what's in there, and you can do a language-to-language -language translator from an image model that doesn't know words. This is a remarkable thing. So here's my summary. If you didn't get it, the first picture was the destruction of the Earth, and this is the Garden of Eden. 
right? Moore's Law is a foundation, and we're actually not close to the limit, right? Computing will improve for the foreseeable future, and the possibilities are actually stunning, right? We're building computers with the same com computation as the brain. Now, they're currently expensive, and they're big, but there's something like a factor of 10,000 available. If you build transistors out of atoms, like who knows what we'll build them out of soon. It's pretty wild. And AI is a transformation of kind, not quantity. Does everybody know? There's, a, there's an expression, at some point a difference in quantity becomes a difference in kind. Like you think about ant versus ant colony. Like ants look random and ant colonies build cities. Right? And so this is a transformation in kind. Like we're building machines that actually understand the data they're operating on. And it's not completely clear to me that we're any different. So. All right, that was my talk. Any questions? <laughs> was that, by the way, is that polite applause or is that like enthusiastic Stanford applause? <laughs> no, I did a talk at, uh, at UT one time with, with some grad students. It was pretty hilarious. Everybody talked a lot. And then I did another one for undergrad students. And Nobody said a word. It was the quietest thing I've ever been in. So I, I, I don't know how to calibrate stuff. Yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. Th from a classical computer design point of view, there's computation, memory, and I/O, right? And you're always you're always building in those constraints, right? This is a paradigm shift. So AI programs run on computers that do those things, but it sort of doesn't care about them, right? When we build a computer out of logic gates, the architects, you know, they care if it, what kind of AND gates and OR gates are, but they don't really care that much about those. And the logic gates are built out of transistors. And again, at these abstraction layers, the abstraction layers are really operating in different places. So AI programs can run on lots of stuff. They run on human brains, right? And they run on computers. And the computational substrate, I don't think, matters that much. To the PowerPoint thing, so my belief is since Every single person has an example of a 25 watt supercomputer with 10 to the 18th operations a second. That the power problems we have today are a technology implementation issues, right? There, there's a lot of work to do on how to go solve those problems, but they're, they're clearly not fundamental because there already exist computers that run at very low power in very small areas. And, and one way to give an example, so um, the Cray-1 was a 10, nano, 10 nanosecond processor. I forget how many gigaflops it was. It took, and it was like three or four million bucks. It took about 35 years to put that in a phone at a watt for $15. So we make, we've been making computation about 10 times faster every five years. And there's kind of a wiggly line on power. Like right now, the power limit is, is, is kind of set by VTs, but even that's kind of odd because there's so much uh, research going on on org functions that I predict that VTs are going to keep going down. And then the fundamental size of the device sets the capacitance. So there's, there's a lot of work to do on that. Um, I, I fundamentally think since we have an example of a low power, computational substrate, we just have to go figure out what to do. Now, the weirdo thing about your brain is it's running at 100 to 1,000 hertz. Transistors' natural frequency is something like, like frequency went up for a while, and then it stalled. Everybody goes, well, what's going on? Well, actually, that's when we hit the natural frequency of the devices. It's about a gigahertz and a half. So if you, you mess with it a lot, you can make them go faster. Right, but it's a ratio of, I mean, I explained this years ago, IED sat to capacitance, right? The, the process gets faster when the car device current 
grows by more than that capacitance, capacitance shrinks. Like that, well, as we make it smaller, I guess the current gets smaller and the cap gets smaller. And as long as the cap gets smaller faster than the current, the frequency went up. And at some point, it became a balance and frequency stalled. And that's mostly been a good thing. And I've been thinking a lot about building a new technology where we just said, oh, hell with a, you know, a gigahertz. Let's go back to 100 megahertz and build all new, d new devices and change that calculation. Right. But we'll, we'll see what happens. So I don't, so it's super fun. Uh, I had a couple of friends that were starting a quantum computing company and they were gonna build arrays of qubits. And we spent like a couple hours, like four sessions going through it. And I, I had some physicist friends and some mechanical engineers. And the number of physics tricks involved in making quantum computing was hilarious. We wish we'd written them all down. Like you cool the atoms off with lasers because at the right frequency they eject phonons. Like you can hold atoms in position, you know, the, the way coupling works is wild. The number of applications that actually run on quantum computers is close to zero. Right. And I, I had a friend who's researched it for a couple of years at Microsoft, and he said, I'm not completely convinced it's not a scam. So, so I, 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 like, I don't know what to think about it. I, I think the hype cycle on the billions, like, I wouldn't invest in, I wouldn't invest more than 100 grand in a uh, quantum startup. But I thought the same with crypto, and I was wrong. Well, no, I was right about that. <laughs> any, any other questions? Oh, you're wrong. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so your brain is 1.3 square feet. It's only six, like six neurons thick. So go look it up. It's organized in cortical columns, about 10 to 100,000 neurons. So in the cortical column, it goes through six layers, right? And it's really highly connected. It's almost fully connected between each layer. And then the layers between them are less connected, right? And the cortical column is like a teraflop. It's amazing, but it's really thin. And the computer is actually laid out in a two-dimensional sheet. Now it's possible it would be better as a three-dimensional sheet. And the way the, 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 the cortex is all bunched up, there's connections into the lower substrate, which is kind of like goes into the IO system and special processing. And, and as people know, the brain has evolved, not designed, so it's, it's probably a mess underneath. Like a, <laughs> but, but it's not very thick. And, and it looks like, and, it, and the really, so Ilya Spitzgever at OpenAI said this. So when you do something really fast, like, like millisecond, you know it's only going through one, one or two passes of a cortical column, right? That's not very much compute technically, right? And then your brain kind of, you can keep thinking. And then when you stew on something for days, your brain is going through it over and over and over and over and over. It's kind of amazing. And this, this part of the brain can activate that part. So the brain structure is really interesting. It's, it's much cleverer than the transformer model, which has these huge matrix multiplies and layers. It's way more distributed, and people don't really know how it works. But it's actually relatively flat. So from that perspective, could that guy get by with the code of the brain structure and still be the optimal? Yeah, I don't know. So the, the tragic thing about 3D stacking is we learn to stack silicon about the time we hit the thermal density of silicon, right? Like 3D stacking would have been great in the 80s. We could have put five of those guys or 10 of them, right? Because the thermal de flux density was low. But, but now we're up at 200 watts per square centimeter, 300 watts. Like basically it's converting electricity to phonons out through the heatsink as fast as possible. Right, in one layer. And so I see all these things like, hey, we're going to put a CPU on top of an SRAM. Really? Have you ever designed an SRAM? SRAMs hate it when like one's really hot and one's really cold. And <laughs> or a DRAM? Really? That's a trap charge. You're just going to energize all those electrons. They're going to escape due to quantum effects as fast as possible. So yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. Like it's, uh, the one thing where it worked is, um, go Google. I was going to throw a picture in for eye candy. Uh, flash devices. So flash devices got so small, 
the electrons tunnel out of the cell, and then they figure out how to stack them. So they made the, the cells bigger, so they stop having the tunneling problem, and now they're 256 tall, which is unbelievably cool. And they're tall because it's really low power, and also they can make the, the layers out of polysilicon because the devices are really small. They don't care about the mobility. Cool thing. Any other questions? Are we going to use AI code to automatically generate stuff? Yes. Now this, so I have, I have a belief. I think, so the, the biggest limit to sequential processors is humans. We're not very good at writing parallel code. We write serial narrative, right? And the weird thing about AI is it's really good at parallel association, right? So I predict we will use AI to write serial code but at some point, we'll start to use it to write more parallel code. And, and there'll be two kinds of code. There'll be code that's actually the AI model itself, which runs in mysterious ways, which, right? And then there'll be functions like, like in a human, we have a motor cortex. When you, when you tell your arm to move, you don't want to think about it and go, oh, I got some options on moving, right? You know, your, your arm just moves. So the, the world computer world is gonna be AI models that, that think and then deterministic models that do what they're told. And the AI models will write the code and the processors for the deterministic models. And that'll happen within 10 years, which is pretty wild. That's a great question. Any more questions? We're good? All right, thanks everybody.